let's go. So what's an open cloud, right? This is an important um, question to ask and answer, and it's a little nuanced, so hang in with me. So first of all, I think you know that it's comprised of open source software, right? That's, that's table stakes, right? And everybody's familiar with open, soft, open source software at this point. I'm pretty sure I don't need to explain that to you. The next piece is open hardware. Now this is a little bit trickier, this is a little bit harder to explain, so bear with me for a moment. So there are different degrees of open. There are different degrees of lock-in. I don't want to get into too nuanced a discussion today about that. But you know, not everything is 100% open, not everything is 100% lock-in. By open hardware, what I mean is hardware that has not been gold-plated. It's not like jewelry. It doesn't have special customizations. It doesn't have things that make it difficult for you to use with open source software. When I went into Korea Telecom to build the public cloud there, they insisted, because they were an HP shop, that I use HP blades. I told them it was a bad idea. They didn't listen to me. So my team spent two months making zero progress because all of the open source software that we tried to use with HP Blades and the HP storage systems would not work. Why? It's because HP in their infinite wisdom is trying to make a closed ecosystem that you have to use all of their tools, their proprietary software, their proprietary uh, tooling. So you go and you open up an HP Blade system and you look at all the components and it's a Samsung SSD. It's not an HP SSD, HP doesn't manufacture SSDs. That Samsung SSD in an HP Blade does not have Samsung firmware in it. It's got special HP firmware. Same with the Western digital drives. Same with the HP Blade motherboard. The BIOS or UEFI was not standard, it was a special HP version. The IPMI interface for powering it off and on and booting them over the network was non-standard. So all of the open source software that we were using would not work with the HP systems because it's a, close, it's a closed ecosystem. Everything's been changed by HP to work with their tools, with their software. With open source software, it doesn't work. I got, Quanta, I got KT to bring Quanta computers in. Two weeks, everything was running. Two months, can't get anywhere. Two weeks, we're done because we started using hardware that was open hardware. It didn't have any special customizations, no special firmware, no special configurations. And I have tons of these stories, like Dell, IBM, all these guys. It, it's, really, it's really a joke. You want open hardware, that's the only thing that'll work. Open APIs, right? You know, if it's a proprietary API, then, you know, it's got the same problem as being, you know, proprietary software. Open standards and licenses. The internet is built on TCP IP. These open standards matter. If I can't use standard IPMI to talk to your x86 server, it is just not acceptable. And of course, we need all of these open cloud characteristics across public, private, hybrid, and storage, right? Any kind of uh, infrastructure as a service system. What does this look like? Well, at NEPA, this is what it looks like. We use OpenStack for our cloud control plane and compute. We use Ceph, which is in the OpenStack ecosystem for storage. We use OpenSDN for networking. We use Tyan and AMD for our servers, just unadorned, you know, normal, non-proprietary boxes. Um, you know, we have customers that use our, our software with Inspur, um, you know, but it's always, you know, one of these generic uh, 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 hardware systems. We use OpenStack APIs, and then of course we have the Amazon Web Services APIs, which are not open per se, but are a de facto winner. The S3 API basically exists everywhere. Um, and then of course we use open standards like TCP IP, MPLS, all that good stuff. And most of our licenses are Apache or GNU. And pretty much that's it. That's the whole stack. So I think you have a pretty good idea about why open cloud matters at this point. You know, there is this 
you know, um, need to not pay for software licenses or, you know, custom proprietary hardware for these um, virtualization systems or cloud systems, if you want. But what's important to really recognize here is that the reason it needs to be cheap, the reason it needs to be cost effective, is that if you are running a virtualization management system, if you're running VMware today, so is everybody else. The money that you're spending on those expensive proprietary systems is money you're spending on IT that you could be spending on some other aspect of IT that might be giving your business competitive advantage. Competitive advantage is key. The pie is this big. If you spend all the money on the pie on things that make other people uh, wealthy, then you don't have any money to spend on the things that will make you and your customers wealthy. Who here is still running their own Exchange server? Nobody? Right? You're on Microsoft 365, you're using Google Mail. Why would anybody hire a Microsoft Exchange administrator? Right? That, that job is gone. Right? It does not exist anymore. That's because email is a commodity. You spending money on running your own email service is ridiculous. It's crazy. It has nothing to do with what your business does. It's not, key, it's not core to what your business or what your customer's business does. Right? And that's reality. And that's virtualization. Virtualization, virtualization management is a commodity. The idea that you should be paying extravagant prices for it at this point is just outrageous. You're just making companies like VMware and Broadcom fat, rich, and happy. They like your money. So who's the leader in open cloud? Well, it's definitely OpenStack. You'll see why. There are other open source cloud management systems. I'll, I'm not even afraid to name them. Open Nebula, CloudStack uh, are a couple of the more prominent ones. Uh, but OpenStack was one of the earliest ones, and it's one of the ones that's most hardened, battle-tested, and scalable. I'm sure everybody here has Line on their phone, right? Line is running OpenStack over one million cores. One million cores. Every time you're sending a message online, your message is going through uh, an over-infrastructure that's running on OpenStack. Agoda, right, the tech, the tech sweetheart of Bangkok, they're running over 300,000 cores of OpenStack. I mean, this stuff works. This stuff works. It's been around for a long time. It's just as mature as VMware, and in some ways, it's more mature and more stable, and it's certainly more open. So <clears throat> OpenStack launched in uh, summer of 2010. I was part of that initial group of 25 companies that supported it. And then the OpenStack Foundation, the organization that basically manages the community, was founded in 2012. When OpenStack, when OpenStack started, <clears throat> when OpenStack started, it was only two projects, Nova and Swift. So compute and storage, object storage. Since that time, it's grown immensely. You'll see later on when Tech gives his presentation that it's north of 50 different projects now. In some ways, you can look at it as you would VMware, right? There's all this VMware software, right? There, it starts with the foundational pieces, ESX and vSphere, but then soon you have vRealize, vRealize Automation and Insights and so on, and there's like a huge stack. And you don't necessarily want that whole stack. You only want as much or as little as you can get, and that's OpenStack. You can use as much or as little as you like. But the important thing is that it's a massive, massive community. There's a huge number of people that are part of it. Uh, some of the largest companies in the world are part of it. You can go take a look at the website. Um, and it's basically a global phenomenon. I think, I didn't put this slide in here, but I, I want to say it's the fourth largest open source project ever in terms of uh, people contributing it, to it, lines of code, um, and uh, size of community. And this is just to show you that, again, year over year, it continues to grow. This is even just a 2021. It's not even to this year. So now the question becomes, how does OpenStack compare to VMware? Well, the
these are two different kinds of systems. They're two different kinds of approaches. VMware was built in an era where cloud didn't exist, where the hyperscalers were, you know, you know, in their infancy, right? Like it really started to have its heyday around 2001 to 2003. That's when VMware started to like get some acceleration. And so it has a certain kind of way of looking at the world. But if we, if we compare it, if we look at sort of the pieces, you'll see that for everything that's in VMware, there's something that is equivalent in OpenStack or something in the open source ecosystem, if not in OpenStack. So if we look at observability and, and management services, that's logging, telemetry, alerting, all of that good stuff. We got Zabbix, we got OpenSearch, and then of course we got OpenStack Heat and Watcher. And these are all equivalents here. So OpenStack Watcher is equivalent to uh, uh, VMware vSphere DRS. If we look at the core cloud services, managing images and templates and multi-VM uh, multi applications and having a pretty dashboard, all that's in there. If we look at the hypervisor, if we look at networking, if we look at storage, all of that's in there, right? Everything that is in VMware is also in OpenStack or the general open source ecosystem. Okay, so I went through a fair bit there fairly quickly, and um, I'm happy to take some questions about that. Uh, do you have questions already? ค่ะใครมีคําถามส่งกันเข้ามาได้เลยนะคะที่ is an open cloud ค่ะแล้วก็ตอนนี้นะคะเรามีคําถามเข้ามาแล้วค่ะจากเอ่อเป็นคําถามจาก Do you think the Broadcom will reverse back the perpetual model Broadcom yeah. stack with the line do you, you think, do you think Broadcom will reverse back the perpetual model No They will not revert back because um, what's funny is that um, and you may have seen this, but uh, for a long time, um, the go-to-market motion of many businesses was around selling a software license on your desktop, for your server, um, whatever it was. And the go-to-market motion meant that people could, especially salespeople, could make very large sales um, you know, of many licenses or many pieces of hardware and get a big commission off that right away. So then this other model came out, came out called software as a service, which was a subscription-based model. And you know, um, all the public companies freaked out about it. Wall Street freaked out about it. You know, that was Salesforce in 2002. And since then, all of those businesses have figured out that you actually make more money over time with a subscription-based model. It is, a it is a better business than perpetual licenses. Perpetual licenses are just good for salespeople. But because it's been 20 years now of getting used to subscription licenses, most businesses really prefer that method. It's that annual recurring revenue stream. You just keep building up over time. You get much better uh, stock valuation by the market. Perpetual licenses are gone. So, can I leave with it? So it's gone. Or maybe you can get our uh, perpetual license, which is open source. Right? Okay. No, uh, perpetual license isn't open source either. Uh, no. Okay. It's, we don't have a perpetual license. Okay. We have a Apache license. I'm, t I'm telling you, I know it's hard to hear, but perpetual licenses as a general model general is model. gone. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yes, sure. Do you have the current price list of VMware compared to price before acquired? Um, we've done some of the research, uh, but we're not VMware customers, so we don't have anything authoritative. We just listen to what our customers tell us, and they, they tell us after they do the math, it's 3 to 4x. Um, there's a bunch, a ton of blog posts out there that do that math for you. So if you don't believe me, you don't believe us, like just Google for it, and you will find it. There's a lot of people who've done the math. There's no need for me to do it for you. Okay, I think that's... Uh to be uh, good for now. I think we have another session. 
uh, but uh, I think really uh, they give us a lot of information about VMware, about the comparison between the OpenStack. Uh, let's give a big round of applause to uh, Randy, please. Thank you.